thank you for all this. Thank you for our Rachel today. Um, I'm Nation Wong from Taiwan. I formed my association 20 years ago. I wrote two books about uh, Taiwan monetization published by Cambridge Dollar Publishing. Um, like many of you, I provide service to ARPBI, Intel, LSI, and a joint teaching in many universities in China, India, including uh, National Law University, Jopu, and uh, Delhi. Um, I also, like many of you, have been visiting scholars in CFC, MPI, TP, Russian Academy of Science. Um, before I become a full-time professor, I worked for AstraZeneca, Moksha Bone, and Target Up from in Marketing, Regulatory, Clinical, and Research Development Department. Um, I also have been a consultant of Korean Government IP Fund Intellectual Discovery. They helped me to build up a skill today to moderate the section. Um, today, my uh, esteemed colleagues, they will uh, demonstrate the real case study how to develop protected IP major and conduct due diligence for IPO, building up IP portfolio uh, assessment process and perform IP evaluation for merger and acquisition. Nevertheless, my esteemed colleagues will also elaborate how to cultivate innovation strategic partnership and uh, leverage IP strategy into business plan. So uh, before handing the floor to my esteemed colleagues, allow me to address the importance why we are here today, because just the first week <coughs> of uh, January, Russia already signed three deals, two deals, two billion deals with MoMA for knowledge space to detect the new drug after the cancer cell growth and survival, and another uh, one billion deal with uh, China-based medical therapeutics and also another billion with Remix therapeutic to create the general small molecular therapeutics. Not only Roche has rushed in the merger acquisition, uh, Bristol Miles Group also struck a 4.1 billion deal with the uh, uh, base file for cancer therapies. AstraZeneca Inc. Uh, 1.2 billion for China-based cell therapeutic companies. But not only pharmaceutical company, they are also eager in merger acquisition. Also, Taiwan company, AUO, they have acquired their helicera control uh, company in Germany for 600 million euro last year. Uh, Wiki Electronics also from Taiwan acquired Future Electronics Canada for 3.8 billion US also last year. For company who can have the competence, ability to perform merger acquisition, they have very powerful competence, not only business-wise, but also IP as a core. So uh, today I would like to turn on the floor to our speaker. Our next speaker is Dr. Ayan Roe Chowdhury from Fisher Richardson in USA. Dr. Anya represents client range from individual inventor and startup organization to multinational organization and Fortune 100 companies. In each matter, uh, Anne tells his approach to unique business needs of the client, giving equal attention to each regardless of size. In addition to the patent prosecution, Anne has uh, significant experience in post-grant work before the patent trial and appeal board, as well as uh, opinion and analysis work for clients looking to build their patent portfolios. Dr. Ang is uh, uh, conversant in a wide range of technology, including telecommunication, networking, network security, cryptography, blockchain, artificial intelligence, machine learning, autonomous vehicle, mobile device software, semiconductor device and circuits, cloud computing, technology software and system, and medical clients, among others. As part of his practice, Ang helps clients obtain essential patterns in cellular and video coding technology and manage portfolios in jurisdictions around the world. Ang received his PhD in electrical and computer engineering from the University of Maryland and his JD from Georgetown University. Prior to his legal career, he worked first as a telecom software engineer in a large multinational and later as the principal engineer at a satellite networking startup, experience that gave him an inside understanding of the needs and concerns of organizations of diverse size in high tech industry. Uh, Dr. Roy Chadri, the floor is yours. Please proceed. 
for having me here and thank you for the uh, thank you to the previous speakers uh, they have pretty much covered everything i have 26 slides uh, i won't go through them no point uh, i will just briefly touch on some of the point, uh, some of the issues that we i have seen in my practice but before i do any of that a quick overview of fish in case you haven't heard of our law firm so we are among the um, top 100 law firms in the United States in size, but when it comes to IP law, we are by far the largest. Our focus is almost 95% IP. Uh, we handle more patent litigation than the uh, number two law firm. We got more patents in 2002 than the next competitors, and same goes for post-grant. We do more than anyone else. So going to the importance of building a strong intellectual IP uh, patent portfolio. My talk is mostly based on patents, but this would cover also other kinds of IP like trade secrets and copyrights and trademarks. Mm -hmm. yes. this is... So the first question that you need to ask yourself as a company is why do you want to get a patent, right? Uh, it's not a one size fits all. When you are a small uh, start, when you are a startup or a small company, your primary focus as a startup would be to gain entry into the market and most importantly to attract investors. And in the U.S., we have seen uh, for seed funding or for Series A, B, or C funding, investors always ask, "Are you protecting your IP?" And to protect your IP, you need to file patents. So that's important for small companies. When you become bigger in size, when you have independent revenue streams and you are not as dependent on, uh, let's say, uh, investors, then the, your strategy shifts slightly. You want to protect <coughs> what you are developing. You also want to carve out a bigger space by trying to target what competitors are doing and try to file patent applications that are not necessarily your products, but they also cover your competitors. And that becomes important when, let's say, you are being sued. And uh, so competitors will take a step back and uh, say, OK, they have patents in our field, in our products. So maybe a licensing would make more sense than getting into a um, dispute in uh, courts. You also uh, go for patents to uh, you can license that can be independent revenue stream apart from your products, uh, like if you are doing so or not all the ideas that you patent eventually become products if you are a bigger company. Like they will file pretty much on everything if you have funds. So ideas that you are not going to be uh, commercializing, you can license those out. So these are very different kinds of reasons for going for patent uh, filings in the US and elsewhere. And oh, I should mention that I would like it if there are questions and uh, rather than me just uh, talking, it would be more interesting if it's an interactive discussion, including from the panel. And so, as I mentioned, like initially, when you are coming up with new technologies, the idea itself is very important, right? But the second point should should be okay. We protect the idea before we disclose it. So it's a concept of innovate and protect, otherwise you will perish. And then, so as you become bigger. Just having ideas will not help. Then when you're going for IPOs or when you are going for, let's say, acquisitions or you are trying to sell your company, the other side will always look for, like, do, the, do their diligence and see how you are protecting your assets, like whether they are patents, whether trademarks, trade secrets, and including uh, additional ancillary uh, topics like licensing, like how you are licensing your uh, IP, what are the terms that you have in indemnification, like uh, to the licenses? Those are all looked into. So I went to, uh, through some of these. Like a strong portfolio does provide you defensive ammunition in terms of others will be taking thinking twice. Uh, like I would rather say more established companies rather than sue, to sue you. They would rather get into licensing. They can also act as uh, offensive. Uh, when you are getting into contentious uh, <laughs> long-term uh, relationships with some other big companies. And then 
they help uh, getting patents kind of motivates in many cases invent uh, your employees yes. like engineers like having patents in their names in many cases and so it kind of gives an incentive to come up with new ideas uh, if nothing else i will leave you with this slide it uh, it is a report from the european patent office which came out in october and the report said that uh, this is directed towards startups, so probably not relevant to very large companies, but certainly startups and smaller uh, firms which are pre-IPO, that if you have IP, you are 10 times more likely to get funding from investors. I have links there uh, for the report. Uh, if you want my slides, please uh, email me afterwards. Are these been shared? <coughs> so you have the slides, but in case you don't have them, uh, email me, I might uh, email this at the very end slide and I can send this, this to you. And so I spoke about the importance of having patents. And the point, then the next point is like, okay, so you want to have patents. So now what do we do? How do you go about building your patent portfolio? And that brings in the question like, what are you going to patent your products? Your, what your competitors are doing, maybe if you have enough funds, but certainly what you are trying to uh, in, uh, invent and innovate, and what you are trying to bring into the marketplace, right? And in doing so, you get a portfolio that contributes to the valuation of your business, and it helps you sub that give you confidence when you bring your product to market that it will be others will think twice before trying to copy what you are doing. Uh, this is. I think I went over most of these slides, so let me go over like when are you going to think about filing for patents? <laughs> there are some inflection points I listed here. One is like when you have a prototype developed, uh, the earlier you file, I think uh, Nitin or someone mentioned that the US system is now first to file, right? So you file early. When you have an idea, you file if you have the funds, even if the idea is not fully developed yet. Uh, because someone else can file and then, uh, and I've seen this in practice, then you are in not in good uh, You file, if you have a product, you are making changes to the product, you file a patent again on the uh, improvements. You look at, as I mentioned, uh, you are, you anticipate getting into, let's say, disputes with other for, uh, companies. If your funds, you look at what they're doing, you do an, uh, due diligence of their products, and you try to come up with patent filings based on their products, even if they have nothing to do with what you are uh, going to patent, you know, what you are going to commercialize. And then I mean, therapeutics and all, uh, if you have like, clinical results and then market adoption and things like that. Yes, please. You said you file, you file an idea. Yes. How do you file an idea without enablement? So uh, you patent an idea always, okay? So a patent is for an idea, and uh, Jaj Deshpande can correct it. Without so, enablement? Yes, yeah, so so you have an so what what how do you patent? You have a disclosure uh, you, from an inventors will write down this is what we have done, or this is what we are thinking of doing. They might not be working yet, but the idea is there, right? And so it is the job of the lawyers who are drafting the applications to make sure there is sufficient disclosure that a person of skill in the art who's reading the patent application can make a sense of what you are trying to patent, what the invention is, and there so this. In the predictable arts in engineering, this is sufficient. If you are getting into pharma and bio, which is not my field, disclaimer, I think the enablement becomes more stringent. Like you can, your, your formulas and your compounds, they cannot be just anything you are coming up uh, out of thin air, right? You have to see that they actually make sense. Did that answer your question? Because there is no such specific requirement anymore that you have to prove enablement. No, because what we are seeing is the standard for enablement is being heightened day by day. I mean, recently we have seen a judgment that comes from US, Amgen versus Sanofi. Yeah. They, even they had a limited enablement, they did not. Because where the outcome of predictability is too much, right. or you're not sure. Because in one way, this leads to gamesmanship that you go about blocking each and every space. Fine, okay. Few of them you did not enable, they go away. But you block all the ideas. Right. And that's not in a spirit. And secondly, right in the day of filing, you did not know how what exactly how to put that into practice. So you didn't have the invention. 
right? And as, so I mentioned about like uh, bio is different, right? And uh, pharma. Uh, that case, uh, yes, I know about the case, and in fact, the uh, USPTO came out with new rules yesterday for that. They are, from what I recall, they had a certain product descriptions, but when it, the claims diverge from what was disclosed in their application, ultimately the claims that were patented. I can I can kind of support uh, answer this question as well from the from US perspective. Of course, I'm not talking about any other jurisdiction. First to file doesn't mean you have to file a non provisional one. You can simply file a provisional application, park it for one year, and then you have whole 365 days to worry about the enablement uh, part, whatever you ask in the question about. So, uh, so just for US perspective, not any other jurisdiction. And as I mentioned, enablement is more important in the pharma fields and all. That, uh, but even otherwise, it's like, do you have uh, sufficient disclosure? Like what you are claiming should be fully disclosed. That is a part of a written description, no? Right, exactly. There's a part, so sufficiency, there are two prongs. One is possession. What exactly is your concept? And how to do? Yeah. Okay, so earliest you come up with. Yeah. Okay. That is a part of a sufficient disclosure, sufficiency. Right, and so what the issue you raised is what they eventually claimed and patented was not sufficiently described in the application. No, so what uh, they disclosed, okay, they tried to cover, they did not diverge, but they tried to cover a larger ambit. More, exactly, so yeah. it's, it goes beyond the description. Uh, no, it was not an added subject matter, based on few examples. Okay, there is so much of variability. Yeah. Okay, that same thing could not be picked and applied to everything. So limited, in the limited, uh, the uh, area that was there, it was applicable, whatever examples they had disclosed, now, but not to all the antibodies. Right, so they were trying to claim a broader, the, yes. the scope was much yes. broader than what we yes. that. Like. Yes, and subsequently another case yes. has come. Okay. I, so, okay, I think we are running short on time. Uh, I will quickly go through what else. Uh, so, most of these are, uh, so the patents that you file for. They can, they will be different depending on the stage of your company and your uh, products. Like the foundational patents are the most important ones, but as you grow bigger, then you go for improvements or to cover other uh, like carve out space and uh, stop your competitors. Um, yeah, one important thing here is that setting aside everything, do investors really care? Right? I mentioned that it's very important for startups. I've also come across startups in the U.S. I've spoken to their CEOs, where they've gotten significant fundings and they've sold their uh, companies, where they said the valuation that the investors did for their portfolio was zero, and he drew a figure like this. Because it was in the defense space, they didn't care as much. But in most technology, high tech, they will certainly care. And uh, this you can go through, like how you grow your portfolio, organic, like what you are developing. Proactive is you license. I think we have covered about licensing of it. And then reactive is when you someone approaches you for licensing. And then you act uh, through acquisitions of other uh, companies, uh, which is like you are trying to get into a new area of business where you have nothing. Then you try to target companies and uh, see who have good portfolios. Okay. okay. Uh, I, as I said, I have 26, so I'll just. Uh, freedom to operate, we, I think uh, Stephen uh, spoke on that. Um, okay, we talked about diligence. The dil diligence comes up very late in the process. Uh, it's interesting, but, but be assured that someone who's uh, trying to buy your company will eventually do full diligence of your portfolio. I've seen that multiple times, and even I have helped advise clients who are trying to acquire other companies whether to go forward with this acquisition or not. Um, this, I think I'll stop here, as I uh, mentioned, th that's my email address, so if you have any questions or if you want to um, on the slides, please feel free to reach out. Thanks. Thank you very much for Dr. Uh, Roy Trumpari's uh, comprehension and explanation. Time, let me, so time is so limited.